accordance with the tradition of the mystery play actors. In other words, the story of the sun and stars was kept alive in the mystery schools. One of the characters was Moses, and he represented the ram of Ares by showing him with ram's horns on his head. This filtered down into religious traditions by showing Moses with horns on his head or his followers blowing the ram's horn in worship. This is not some form of devil worship. It is symbolic of the age of Ares. The previous age was Taurus, the bull. This is the bull, or rather the age, which the Moses character was leading his people away from. This age of the ram ended with the slaughter of the ram when Father Abraham, the father of Christianity, slaughtered a ram instead of his son. Just as Mithra kills the bull to usher in the age of the ram, Abraham kills the ram of Ares to usher in the next age, the age of Pisces. Jesus takes us out of the age of Ares into the age of Pisces. And what was his first miracle? He turns regular water into wine and feeds the masses with two fish. These represent the two fish of Pisces. Jesus was the fisher of men. Christians today often put a fish symbol on the back of their car or on their clothes. The Pope's mitre is a fish head, looking exactly like the fish heads, representing the age of Pisces, the age of Christianity, the age of the fish. So even the clergy reflect this age, but the symbol, the symbol of the fish comes from the Vesca the Vesca Piscis or the Vesca Pisces and the Vesca is a symbol of the spiritual portal which emerges from the harmonious balance of two complementary polarities intuition and intellect knowledge and practice yin and yang heaven and the earth spirit and science it's two complementary polarities that create this this spiritual portal if you consider its shape, it is a spiritual portal. It is the shape of the yoni. We must have this spiritual portal in order to exist. The only way for us to enter into this dimension is through this portal, which emerges from the harmonious balance of two complementary polarities, male and female, as we enter into this dimension through this spiritual portal. Our Lady of Guadalupe is often seen standing inside this symbol of the Vesica. Pagan traditions will have people being drawn through this symbol, physically drawn through this symbol as they are said to have been born again, born into this cult or into this family. So just to bring a close to the talk of ages and becoming to the end of an age, in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says that I am with you always to the very end of the age. So when the age ends, well, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So there is an age to come. Luke tells us that there is an age to come. in the age and in the world which are to come. So if, if Jesus is with us until the end of the age, and this age is about to end, is this reflected in the Bible? And it is. As Jesus is about to be crucified, the end of Jesus in the Bible, as Jesus is about to be crucified, he is going to have his last meal or the last supper. And the day came of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go make preparations for us to eat the Passover. This is the last supper. And they replied saying, where do you want us to prepare for it? Where are we going to prepare this last meal for you? And Jesus said to them, behold, when you enter into the city, a man shall meet you bearing a pitcher of water. 
follow him into the house that he entereth in. And symbolically, this is stating, you will recognize the new age by a man bearing a pitcher of water. And you will follow him into the house. And houses are the houses of the zodiac. So this house is represented by a man bearing a pitcher of water. And that's exactly what the age of Aquarius is, is the man with the water pitcher. You don't see men in history bearing water. You see the woman fetching the water, the woman at the well, the women with the water pot on their head. So a man carrying the water pot is symbolic. It's symbolic of perhaps a return, a slow return to egalitarianism. Abraham was going to stab his son, but instead he ends up stabbing the ram. Just as Mithra was stabbing the bull when Jesus was stabbed on the cross. When Jesus was stabbed on the cross, his blood was collected in a cup. This cup has been a long sought after treasure for many people all throughout the ages. And we're going to talk about this cup. We're going to talk about the body and the blood now. And this is a good segue into communion where Christians will participate in a ritual, a, a blood drinking ritual, a mock blood drinking and flesh eating ritual. And this is why they do this, is because of the verse in the Bible. And as they were eating it, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. And he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And it is a bit strange that people continue these rituals today without really knowing the origin of just exactly where these things come from. This can cross the line into offensive territory, but this is forewarned in the Bible because the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat and Jesus said to them I tell you the truth unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood you have no life in you whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And upon hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? The physical body and the blood part, that's the symbolic part. But before we can get into this, we need to understand the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of ancient writings containing nearly all of the Old Testament. They were discovered in caves near the Dead Sea in Qumran from 1947 into the mid-1950s. This caused immense anticipation from Christians everywhere as the scrolls were thought to be a guarantee for the church to prove Christianity correct. It appeared as though the only thing left to do was to read and interpret the scrolls and Christians would have all the proof they needed. This was because the Dead Sea Scrolls were written in the Semitic language of Aramaic between 250 BCE and 136 CE. This was the era that the Jesus character was said to be walking the earth. To find scrolls written in his language during the period of time in which he was said to be living was a major finding, and Christians everywhere were excited about this. So, what did the scrolls say? Did they read like newspaper headlines speaking of a Jesus of Nazareth? These were questions that had to be answered. Consequently, the best of the best were called upon by the church for their translation skills. John Marco Allegro was a researcher in philology who had graduated with a first class honors degree in Oriental Studies from the University of Manchester. He had earlier begun training for the Methodist ministry but had left to pursue the degree course when he found that studying biblical languages was making him question the foundations of his Christian belief. While working toward a doctorate at Oxford, 
he was invited to join the original Scrolls editing team in 1953. In 1954, he became an assistant lecturer at Manchester and considered an up-and-coming philologist in regards to Middle Eastern and Mediterranean languages. Allegro was the only agnostic on the international team of Dead Sea Scrolls translators. Most of the other members of this so-called International Scrolls team were ordained Catholic priests. The work of this team, which was organized by Father DeVoe, was originally supposed to be published as soon as possible and open to scholarly interpretation. John Allegro was the only member to publish all of his translations in the learned journals as soon as he felt they were ready to be laid open to scrutiny. The other members of the team tended to hold on to their allocations for so long that some people, including Allegro from time to time, suspected a cover-up and suppression of the research. In fact, Allegro was asked several times to hold back on some of his translations for several years or face retribution. He sometimes unwillingly complied. If not a cover-up, an unwillingness to tell all, all at once. There always was a feeling that if we go carefully, we can release the information in a way that need generate no hostility or over-questioning. But we will do. We will control it. By 1968, Allegro completed and published all of his translations of the Cave 4 scroll fragments assigned to him. In the 15 years since the international team was put together in 1953, Allegro was the only member to finish his assigned duty. The remaining scrolls were not published until 1991, when the Huntington Library in San Marino, California finally released the photographs of all the scrolls to expedite their publication. The other members of the original team held on to most of their translations until after 1997, which was 29 years or more after Allegro, and 50 years or more since the original discovery of the scrolls in 1947. During this time, scholars who attempted to question the orthodox view, as Allegro found out, had their careers destroyed. There is much to learn about John Allegro. He was the only member who wasn't a committed Christian and considered himself agnostic. An agnostic is someone who doesn't believe in nor against any religious philosophy, and this placed Allegro at an unbiased advantage over the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls team. The other men, unlike Allegro, had a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, that Jesus was a real man and that the scrolls in no way threatened the foundations of Christianity. Because of Allegro's differing ideas on the scrolls and his public statements about them, he was made the target of sharp and unjustified criticism by his teammates who attacked him in the press. And it seemed to me in the reference in that scroll to crucifixion that it brought us much closer to the Christian story, the myth of Jesus. And then when I published this, there was such an outburst, uproar, not least among my colleagues who were afraid of the fear that it would upset people that Jesus was the first prophet to be crucified or something. Uh, no more than that. The, 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 drink, the links between Jesus and the, the leader of the Essenes were much closer, or could have been much closer than it had hitherto been realized, that the uniqueness of the Christian story was a, a, a sort of risk that they then wrote a letter to the Times. And I realized then I'd walked into a minefield But by 1967, Allegro's openness to other ideas had brought him in contact with the works of Professor Ramsbottom of London's Botanical Museum. Ramsbottom is likely the proper founder of the field of ethnomycology. Allegro also came across the works of R. Gordon Wasson, the famous amateur mycologist who is presently credited as the founder of this field of study. These people had suggested that the foundations of Hinduism and early Judaism were based on drug cults that used the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Allegro, based on his deep understanding of biblical lore, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and ancient history and language concluded that the foundations of Christianity could not be any different.
I believe that the innocent collection of tales and sayings, which was apparently allowed to pass freely among the beleaguered cells of believers. The Bull. This is the bull, or rather the age, which the Moses character was leading his people away from. This age of the ram ended with the slaughter of the ram when Father Abraham, the father of Christianity, slaughtered down into religious traditions by showing Moses with horns on his head or his followers blowing the ram's horn in worship. This is not some form of devil worship. It is symbolic of the age of Aries. The previous age was Taurus with the tradition of the mystery play actors. In other words, the story of the sun and stars was kept alive in the mystery schools. One of the characters was Moses, and he represented the ram of Ares by showing him with ram's horns on his head, his filties. And what was his first miracle? He turns regular water into wine and feeds the masses with two fish. These represent the two fish of Pisces. Jesus was the fisher of men. Christians today often put a fish or a ram instead of his son. Just as Mithra kills the bull to usher in the age of the ram, Abraham kills the ram of Ares to usher in the next age, the age of Pisces. Jesus takes us out of the age of Ares into the age of Pisces.